Hello, everyone. My name is Heather. I have been a developer. I'm a developer advocate at Chef. I've been there for about a year. It's actually been one year exactly. I really cannot see with these uh, lights, but that's okay. Um, my background is in software development. I've worked at seed, seed stage startups and enterprise startups, and uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, but kind of in the process of moving to Barcelona, Spain. So if anyone is in Barcelona, come say hi to me. Um, we're kind of talking about doing a DevOps Days Barcelona 2026. So if anyone is interested in that, let me know. Um, I got a degree in religion at a liberal arts school, and then I decided to kind of be a farmer or a baker, and baking worked out first. So I decided to change careers after about six years being a baker, professional baker, pastry chef, because I kind of uh, felt like there was a limit. There was a glass ceiling with what you could do. There's only so many combinations of uh, flour, water, salt, sugar, milk, and eggs. So it's kind of limited, but with tech, everything is constantly changing. So there's really always something to learn. Um, and the thing that I really love about DevOps, like I think about this all the time, I always go back to the DevOps handbook, which um, John Willis and um, Patrick both were authors on that book. And who here has read that one? Okay, maybe a fourth. I, I really suggest reading that book if you haven't. It inspired me and it made everything click when I was a full stack developer of like what we were doing in these practices and how um, it really can like help you feel like everything is clicking. So today we're gonna um, talk about DevOps and baking. This is kind of where we're going with it. I always like to know where the talk is going. So uh, we're gonna touch a little bit on culture and automation and then look at the concept of out of the box versus mixing from scratch. There's a little bit of analogy here and there and then we'll look at disaster recovery recipes for success and state of DevOps reports. So before we really get cooking, there um, are a few questions that I kind of want to ask because I like to get to know the audience a little bit. So I feel like we're talking together instead of me talking at you. So uh, how many people in here are developers, engineers, programmers? Okay, most of you, perfect, love that. Um, how many uh, people bake at home? Ooh. Love that. Okay, how many people have baked like cookies from home, either from a pre-made dough or a dough from scratch? Okay, cookie fans, great. Um, what about a cake? Have you, let's say a cake from scratch. I love that you guys are are engaging with me because sometimes like no one will answer, like respond, and it's like I know you're just opting out. So who here is just opting out from this hand raising activity? <laughs> One, two, three, thank you for being honest, to love that. You know, it's a good stretch to raise that hand up, so. Um. Okay, well, like I said, I, uh, use, I work at Chef Software, and who's heard of that before? It's been around for a little bit. Okay, cool, you'll, you'll hear from uh, my manager, and we'll, like, I think to <clears throat> later today or tomorrow, but um, who's using it now? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Uh, who's never heard of it? <laughs> okay, that makes me feel pretty good. Um, so Chef, it's not to be confused with this esoteric um, programming language, the Chef programming language. This one was uh, designed, it's a stack-oriented programming language designed to make programs look like cooking recipes and it's just kind of fun and challenges like the concepts of like what it is to be a programming language. And um, this talk actually originated about a year ago. I, uh, my first, my third day was at ChefConf Seattle and they were doing Ignite talks. And so I said, why not? I'll do one and what can I really talk about for five minutes? And of course, baking is something I'm very obsessed with. So I decided to do DevOps and baking. The talk was called Pastry Chef to Progress Chef. And um, it just kind of turned into something that I did over and over again, like DevOps days kept accepting the talk and it just really made me happy. Um, and me, like I've pivoted a lot in my career and Chef Software has too. It's gone through some big changes. It was acquired in 2020 uh, by Progress. And funny enough, last night I was kind of browsing LinkedIn as you do when you're 
mindless, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I saw that Adam Jacob, the um, creator of Chef, he published this blog post um, about the general availability of his current company system initiative. And as a developer advocate for Chef, I'm still learning about all the lore and history of the software to really get a sense of what it is in this community and where it could go and what we are now. So, um, you know, I really enjoy meeting people in this, in this community and also in the Chef community because there are so many people like we saw with the hands that have used it before or maybe have worked with Chef before or worked at Chef before. And everyone always has like this look in their eye that is so intriguing to me. And I just wish I could go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago and understand what was going on and be with these people because it really does influence like who you are as an organization. <laughs> so um, I kind of, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but I included this really wordy uh, paragraph that I thought had some concepts that really resonated with me that uh, DevOps, it's always complicated. And so as I was like developing this talk, I was having some trouble finding some really prescriptive things to tell everyone, knowing that everyone's setup is very different and it's, it can get very complicated. And he goes on to kind of talk about some um, of like Chef's customers back when he was you know, doing that project. And at the end he says like he's never encountered a company that's, whose technology infrastructure was simple. And I just think that's like, thank you. Thank you for, for like pointing out, like it, it's not very simple these days, is it? Does anyone have like a really simple infrastructure setup? Is anyone just like a one person DevOps team? They do all their development. Ooh, okay, cool, great. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I told my friend that he, he does all the development for his, he's an indie game dev and he does all the development and operations. And I was, I called him like the DevOps team. <laughs> and he laughed at me, he's like, I'm not a team, I'm just one person. It's like, but you're doing all the development and operations, so you're the DevOps team. Um, which makes me wonder, is it possible to be a one person DevOps team? No, you say no. Does anyone say yes? I say why not? Okay. Moving on, uh, baking and culture and automation. This is the foundation of both DevOps and baking. So with automation, if we think about the way that we scale over time, hobby bakers, myself, one of my biggest hobbies is farming and gardening. So I would love to have chickens, cows, fields of grains and sugar cane so that I can um, grow my own eggs, milk, churn my butter, harvest wheat, extract sugar just to bake a cookie. Even when I was a baker and living with a dairy farmer, I was only really able to connect uh, or to collect fresh eggs and use raw milk to bake. And I would source like wheat from the southeast region from um, the states, and you know it was eight hours away, but it was still like local to us. And um, we had honey and sorghum in Tennessee, but those kind of behave very differently as substitutes and recipes for um, that call for sugar. So as a hobby baker, you, you have all this ability and choices, but it's very limited because you're a one-person shop. But then, you know, as you kind of grow in baking and you, let's say you're a bakery now or you're in a bakery, it's, this is like an organization with a few different products with some similarities. So you can get creative and use some of those same tools and doughs across different products. Let's say that your croissant dough is the base for the cinnamon rolls and the danishes and the sausage rolls and the pan au chocolat and the babka and the pies. And so you're, you have this one base dough and you're using it across like all your products. And it's kind of like using um, you know, infrastructure as code tool, like chef or you know, whatever flavor you go with to provision all your servers and, can, and each one gets configured a little differently from the next. You're likely to have one team that focuses only on croissant dough a team that only does um, server provisioning or you know, they own that aspect of the organization. And as the business grows, maybe it becomes unreasonable to fold all your croissant dough by hand because who wants arthritis at an early age? You, know, like you, you really want a machine to do all that rolling um, of both the dough and the servers. So we automate that part and we use machines or tools to do that. And then we reduce the cognitive load and have the capacity to play around with new flavors of fruits and tooling and linting and testing. So, um, you know, we see as we scale, we have to have these trade-offs and like 
with production bake baking, um, let's say this is kind of like platform engineering. <clears throat> You're offering like these baked goods as a service. Let's say you have a sandwich shop and you really want to focus on making the best soups possible. So you're entirely consumed by making the, the greatest soup and you cannot waste a drop of your time on making bread. Um, so you get that bread from a trusty, reliable, consistent baker that can handle all your needs because sometimes bread is just a vehicle for other foods and you can focus on really your core business model and that kind of mentality can go into the way that you look at your um, infrastructure and your setup. Mm. So culture. Um, I've been doing a little bit of a touring of DevOps days lately. And this one is from DevOps Days Antwerp, which was three months, three weeks ago. And um, this is Mandy Walsh. She used to work at Chef, and now she works at PagerDuty. And her talk was on culture is still a challenge. And you can't really read this. There's kind of a bad word up there, so it's probably good that you can't, but it's um, three fish in a bowl, and the one fish is saying, uh, morning, boys, how's the water? And then the other two respond with, what the heck is water? Because when you try to think about culture, and you're new to it, and you start thinking about it, you're just, you don't really know how to describe it sometimes, because you're in it, you're living it, you're embodying it in it. It's like everything around you, everything before you, and everything you know, after you, and every, like, it's... It can be a lot to try to define. But here's you know, some loose definitions. Um, culture is made up of all these different components. And this is, I know, culture with us as humans. And the way that you think of culture within your organization is very different. And if you have a chance to check out Mandy's talk, she kind of goes into the organizational um, culture elements. And um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to the DevOps community. My first DevOps days was six months ago. Um, who has been to a DevOps days in a different city? Okay, cool. Yeah, they're really fun to go to, um, right? Like, you get to experience different cultures. And I'm sorry I keep shielding the, the lights, but it, like, I can't see. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this month I've spoken at, like, Antwerp, Vil Vilnius, Porto, and now London. And it's really great to both see what the DevOps community is as, as a whole and also how it is represented in each of those cultures because I'm finding that like compared to, you know, I came from a web dev background, so compared to that, I find that we are very friendly, very inclusive, um, and it just, it feels a little safer here versus web dev in my personal opinion. I won't get into that very much, but like, it's, it kind of builds this sense of um, who we are as a whole in, by going to all these different DevOps days, and I encourage everyone, if they have the ability to, to go to as many as you can. Um, because I find that like when you are in this new space, you seek out what is familiar, friends, technologies, and people um, that have something in common, and then once you're kind of comfortable in a space, you're able to really expand and you know, get creative with where you are. So, um, and Patrick kind of touched on this, like creativity is a really like useful element with growing. And I think, I'm not really an AI person right now. I'm not a bot is what I'm saying. But um, I think that the advantage that we have as people is that we can really use our creativity and individualism and our sense of playfulness to like work with AI and like expand to something greater and stay relevant in that way maybe. So I'm gonna argue that our abilities to be creative and playful um, keep us, give us a com competitive advantage to AI. <laughs> uh, I hope that's true because I really like working uh, and living. So, you know, we don't want the um, anyway, I'm not going to go into dystopian land, but uh, play really encourages divergent thinking, which is crucial for, for creativity, and when employees engage in these playful um, activities, it stimulates their imagination and helps them see problems from different angles. Google is a big example of that, and um, engaging in play can really increase productivity by prevent, providing regular mental breaks. 
and it also increases like satisfaction and great for overall well-being and preventing burnout. So um, you need to go a little, little faster. So uh, I made this beautiful graphic because I'm definitely not a design person, but uh, you know this concept of of like using tools out of the box. Um, who sees some tools that they use right now? Hopefully everyone. I feel like I tried to get all the main ones, you know? Okay, great. So um, during DevOps days, um, Vilnius's open spaces, there was one about like who gets to decide best practices and what are the best practices anyway? And generally it's the standard or common way of doing things. And sometimes it's shaped by the tools that we use. They have prescriptive documentation and those are the ones, um, and, and then who gets to decide on tooling, like who decides which box to pick? And if you're lucky, it's the engineering team, right? Um, but often you see that it's the leadership wanting to bring in these big changes and be known for introdu introducing Kubernetes or whatever tool, and um, it's, sim it's simple because someone, like for them, it's in, like maybe leadership is in the C-suite and they get to make these tool, these choices based on like, whether or not they like the salesperson. Um, and so they're sometimes like the way that we choose tools is not necessarily based on like what tool is best for the job. But most companies, they have their own tech stack and um, it's rare to see a company that does everything in-house. They do exist out there, I'm sure. And, um, but, but most of them do not, they haven't been around long enough to, to do everything in-house. So really at the end of the day, when you're choosing tooling, it's kind of a question of like, does this tool fit into your core business model? And if not, then why do you want to, um, like do you want to home grow something or is there another tool that best fits your use or is there a way to balance tool, tools with um, what you can create in-house? Like you have to consider all these different resources and sometimes it's just not really realistic to you know, raise chickens and cows and grow grain fields and churn all your butter just to make one batch of cookies for your friends. So it's better to just use GitHub, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's another little diagram with a bunch of tools to overwhelm you with. Um, there's a lot going on, right? So, you know, DevOps, it can be overwhelming. Like it was coined and the term was coined in like 2007, 8, 9, as kind of a response to waterfall and, and kind of borrowed from um, agile methods. And then in the 80s, you know, software development was like more of a one person show and servers were like in house. And uh, you could really do everything from scratch back in the day, from what I hear. And over time, the complexity grew, and so do the teams and the tooling. Um, responsibility was broken up and then these silos were created again. So we see all these these tools to help us with efficiency along the way. But we are again kind of facing this issue of feeling like we're in silos and having this cognitive um, overload from all these different toolings that we have to keep up with and manage. So uh, we won't really be deep diving into tooling right now, but um, you know there's a lot out there and sometimes it's it's just, it's helpful to reorganize what we're seeing and looking at to something that's a little more visually appealing. Like I'm neurodivergent, so I love little systems and tables. And as someone who has studied a lot of chemistry in my past, this is like very pleasing to me. Has anyone seen this before? Like I just freaking love this periodic table. I've, ne I've never used it for anything like with software related, but I just like looking at it and like learning about everything. Um, so anyway, I am going slow because I've gone, gotten no sleep, but let's just keep on going. So our team's actually building tools from scratch or running DevOps manually. There's a lot of things to consider, and here's a nice little table with a lot of words. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into that little analogy. Um, planning and prepping is the first, first um, stage. So this was like kind of built from the Ignite talk where I look at both DevOps and baking in four different stages. And with planning and prepping, you know, with software development, the um, answer to most questions is like, it begins with, it depends. You know, what are you building? Who is it for? What resources do you have? So with planning and prepping, if it's your first iteration of a recipe, maybe you pick a recipe and a tool based on your experiences and your uh, standard practices and cookbooks. But if it's not your first iteration or your first rodeo with cookies or infrastructure configuration, and you're not quite happy with the smell, the code smell, or you know the chocolate, the way it, it sits with the flour, then we're adjusting the variables. We're gonna 
add a pinch of YAML or a few lines of Ruby or maybe you reduce the sugar by 10% or add some linting to your workflow. Like you do these little adjustments with each iteration and you see how it plays out um, with the build and then you just, you keep the things that work for you and then you, you know, maybe revisit the things that don't. <laughs> the next stage we're gonna look at is building and mixing. Um, so by the time we're here, ideally everything has been considered and pieced together um, for products that we envision and teams know what they're doing and how to get there. So it's just kind of like ideally an autopilot step. When I was a baker, a professional baker, I, um, I made a lot of biscuits. And it's an American Southern biscuit and not the cookie biscuit over here. So um, I would do that. I would make like three to 500 every week. And the first time I made it, the, I brought them out to my boss and she just looked at them and was like, why do they look like that? <laughs> it really hurt my feelings, but I didn't give up. I kept going, I kept iterating and um, eventually I won you know, a wor an award for best biscuit at the International Biscuit Festival. So, um, you know, sometimes you just have to, I know I'm like, <laughs> do you wanna try my biscuits? <laughs> Okay, maybe later. Okay, great. Find me later if you want to try my biscuits. So. <laughs> I'm running out of time, so I need to keep going. So the next stage is uh, deployment and baking. This stage relies heavily on trustworthy tools. Was that violation of code of conduct to offer my biscuits? No, yes? I don't, I don't know if it means something different here. <laughs> I'm legitimately talking about baked goods. <laughs> um, Anyway, so at this point, <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm really sweaty. Okay, uh, man, uh, deploying and baking. Ideally, our tooling is configured properly and <laughs> we're able to trust with the highest confidence that things will turn out the way that we anticipated with all of our tools, environments, um, does, research, planning, prepping. And so we can move on to the final stage, monitoring and feedback. Um, this one's really important, and I, I think I don't know why, but like my friends tell me that I have this like weird face that whenever I'm like smelling a baked good for the first time, I make this face, and it really startles them because it's like, what are you doing in there in that head, thinking of that baked good? So monitoring and feedback is just me just like collecting logs of the baked goods that we're um, that I'm trying. So you know, ideally we're spending time with the products and understanding how people engage with what we created and reflecting upon the insights. Um, first impressions, interpretations, interactions, all to influence those future iterations because we want that tight feedback loop. Here's another little analogy of uh, DevOps tiers. I'm not gonna go through it because six and a half minutes um, left. And so let's move on. So disaster recovery planning. I learned to code while I was developing recipes. I would uh, get up early and bake breads and then take an afternoon nap in my car in the parking lot and then attend these evening and week weekend classes at Natural Software School. And I did that for a year and towards the end of the year, I got really burnt out from doing that nonstop. So um, at the bakery, we would bake these really big loaves. They're like the size of a toddler. Each one was about like 10 kilograms. Is that right? Yeah. Um, for restaurants to buy in bulk. And one day I was baking four of those loaves and completely spaced out and I burned all four of them pretty badly. I think I was juggling like five or six different things and like a timer went off so I turned it off and I checked on the bread. It needed a few more minutes but I didn't like set another timer. And so it just, I completely forgot them. They burnt black to a crisp and I had to uh, compost them. And since like I felt really bad and I've never built, I've like really never burnt anything because I'm like super anxious and hyper aware of like what's in the oven. So, um, Having a plan of what to do in that case is so important because, you know, in, in our case, we would be mixing doughs three days in advance. So we had a lot of extra dough to make it okay. Um, but maybe you don't have like servers, like three or four different sets of servers around to switch to backup. So depending on your um, organization and what is critical, there's a lot of factors to consider, like what systems are critical and the data and what has priority and uh, what is essential for recovery, you know, and, and then having the resources to actually recover those things. So it's similar to baking, knowing what could go wrong and what you would do in those instances. Because if a chocolate cake doesn't rise, then 
hey, it's just a brownie, that's awesome. Like, you have a brownie. <laughs> I prefer that over the cake, honestly. Um, a burnt piece of toast can be just, you scrape it until it's golden. Like, that's disaster recovery. Uh, cookies, if they disappoint you, you can really just blitz them up, add some butter, and you're, you have cookie butter. And this, yeah, yeah. Try it if you haven't, I recommend it. <laughs> um, still bread, it turns into croutons. So, um, I hope that everyone has, has thought about like what disasters could go wrong because um, often, sometimes it's human error, sometimes it's outages, natural disasters, and we can really guarantee that things will go wrong at some point. So here is another slide. Um, so in the case of burning bread, I smelt the burning, immediately moved the, removed the bread, and then immediately started to shape replacement loaves from the backup dough, and then we composted the burnt bread, checked for the state of the new dough, and then um, explained to everyone and profusely apologized. And never, ever, ever, ever have I not had a timer running while baking. So, you know, timers, um, they're really great. <laughs> okay, here's some recipes for success. Uh, we're not gonna go through them, but they're very general, and maybe something resonates with you. Um, okay, so the state of DevOps report. So both Puppet and Google Cloud are here, and if who's heard of the Dora state of DevOps report? And have you read it too, or just heard of it? Okay, not as many. Like, I'm kind of surprised, honestly. Um, and then Puppet also, I think it used to be one report, and then it split, but um, they also do a state of DevOps report and lately, they've been focusing on the evolution of platform engineering, which is a really kind of interesting juxtaposition of DevOps and platform engineering. And um, some of their, their findings, um, I, I really suggest that you go read both reports, the state of DevOps from Puppet and Dora and Google Cloud. But for platform engineering, you know, it's, um, it can act as a barrier against the chaos of tools, tasks, and information. So you can really spend all that time focusing on making the most perfect sandwich and soup in the world and not worry about uh, the bread that the platform engineering team makes. And then for the State of DevOps report, um, that's through Dora. This was from 2023. I think they're releasing this one for 2024 in October. And here's just some key findings. <clears throat> and one of the points that it makes towards the end of the report is about distributing work fairly because underrepresented groups, they have higher rates of burnout because a lot of um, systemic and environmental factors can cause that. The people who take on more repetitive work are often more likely to experience the burnout and the underrepresented groups are more likely to take on repetitive work. So it was um, kind of interesting to see those statistics. There's some really beautiful graphs there. So I <laughs> recommend that you go look that one up if you haven't already. And um, that's kind of it for me. Here's a few ways to connect. If you play Pokemon Go, please come find me. Um, LinkedIn, X slash Twitter, um, sprinkle on the DevRo DevOps. I'll be around at the chef booth. And thank you all.